Good evening. Sorry we took just a second of a delay to get started there. Um, we're working out a few technical issues, but I want to thank you for joining us. I'm Charles Dupree, Superintendent of Fort Bend ISD. You probably see on the screen with me our Deputy Superintendent, Diana Saavedra. We're going to have a, another couple of speakers let, later this evening, and um, we're going to spend just a few minutes going over our back to school plans in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been um, an interesting few days in Fort Bend. As you know, Monday, we um, shared our plans publicly with the board for the first time. We've updated our website and sent um, a staff message with many details. But we wanted to go ahead and take a few minutes this evening as well to go through all of this information again for the greater community. And so I hope, I'm hopeful that we have parents, students, community members, and staff members with us this evening to hear a little more detail to get a good grasp on where we're going as we plan the new school year. We have several items we're going to touch on tonight. We're going to talk about our planning. We're going to talk about launching the new school year. The first day of school is currently scheduled for August 12th. We're going to talk about the school year calendar a little bit, and then we're going to talk about instructional expectations, health and safety protocols, our special student populations, as well as next steps. And then at the end, we're going to spend some time getting into questions and answers many of you have sent in. And so we're going to ask and um, share those questions directly and respond to them. We're hoping to be done between 8 and 8.15. So I'm going to move pretty quickly through the PowerPoint. I don't want to belabor a PowerPoint presentation because we really want to get to the heart of the issue, which is your questions. First thing we want to talk about, though, and I think this is probably the heart of everything that we share tonight is as we talk to our community, as I shared with the board on Monday, I want our community, every single person who's listening, and even if you're watching the recording, I want you to understand that in Fort Bend ISD, we are dedicated to doing what is right and best for our students and for our staff. We're getting a lot of questions from parents, which then that are about the challenges the parents are facing right now in dealing with their children's social emotional needs. And, and it's just critical that you understand that we care about the unique need of every single student in our district. We do. We, we know 
that school is important to our children. They need the, uh, certainly they need the instruction. They need the relationship with the teacher. They need to be with their peers. They need to be on the football field, the volleyball court, in the marching band field. They need to be in the kickstart classes. They need to be in their art class. Whatever it is that they love and they, that connects them to school, they need that and we recognize that. And that's what makes our decisions even more challenging because there's nothing more that I want as superintendent that our board wants or our staff wants than is to have all of our students back in school, back to normal. But unfortunately, that is not a reality right now. Um, even today, we're dealing with increasing numbers of, of, the, of the virus in our own local community. And our county is on red alert by the, that's been issued by our, by our county judge in the last couple of days. So we have to deal with the reality of first protecting our teachers and helping them feel safe coming into the workplace so that they can be healthy and strong each day to serve our students. And then of course, we care about our students and their health and the potential risk that they could carry the virus home into their homes and into their family members into our broader community. One thing we don't ever forget in Fort Bend is that we are the largest, we're the largest employer in Fort Bend County with 11,000 employees serving nearly 80,000 students. So the decisions we make have a very, very broad impact. And as much as we care about the individual need of the, of the individual student, we have to make decisions that serve the best interest of really this entire community, because what we do could dramatically impact the how long this virus stays active um, and thriving in our community. And I know there's many different political perspectives on all of that, and I'm not gonna debate that. We're doing everything we can to work with medical professionals, unbiased in a way to make the best decisions for our community. And as I've shared publicly on numerous occasions, we can't have school if our teachers can't come to school or won't come to school. So that's a critical decision that we have to deal with. The other uncertainty that we're dealing with is we don't know when the virus is going to level out and go into decline. We're hopeful it will be soon so that things can get back to routine as soon as possible. And we've talked about some hard things this week and I'm gonna share more information this evening about athletics and online classes. But our reality is some of these things need to wait a little while. So I want you to hear me say, not now, not yet. I'm not saying not never because it is our full plan is that we want to have things back up and running as soon as we possibly can. So we want our, we want our students, we want our community and our moms and dads to, to be hopeful that we will be back to some semblance of normalcy or at a minimum for those who are, are comfortable returning to a full face-to-face -face environment, we want to provide you that opportunity as soon as we possibly can. But right now we're in the process of considering several pieces of data as we make these important decisions. And so I want you to fully appreciate that stakeholder feedback has been incorporated into every decision we make. And this is a question that's, that we're dealing with regularly this week is, well, if other districts are doing things differently than Fort Bend, why is Fort Bend make choosing the path that they're choosing? Uh, you've heard me talk before about the fact that superintendents in our region were very close. I talked to all of the superintendents at least once to twice a week in, the, in our direct area and really all of us throughout the region because we know how important it is for us to stay aligned in our decision making. In this case, however, this is a very unique instance because the community in Aleph ISD feels very differently than the community in Katy ISD is very, has different feelings than Lamar Consolidated, which has reflected differently than the community in Fort Bend ISD. And one thing we're seeing is our diversity is driving a great deal of community concern. In all of the districts throughout the state that have taken a common survey, and that, that's the survey data I went over in the last live event, which is still available for you to watch online, all of the results of that survey are directly related to race and ethnicity. What we're finding is our individuals of color in our communities, again, throughout the state, are very concerned about exposure to the virus. So in a district like Fort Bend ISD, 
where a significant population are people of color, um, Hispanic and African American in particular, that is driving a, a high level of concern about returning to face to face. It's very, high, it's even higher in some other districts like A Leaf that are even more diverse than Fort Bend in regard to specific ethnicities. Although we're diverse across the board, we are African American and Hispanic populations are still very large in our district, but we're seeing that direct relationship. So I want you to understand that we are certainly operating from a place where our core beliefs and commitments are driving our decision making because we are committed to helping all students achieve their full potential. We want our schools to serve them well on good days and on bad, whether we can be in school or whether we need to be closed and doing learning online. But we also have to value the diverse opinions of our exceptionally diverse staff and our community. So when you, when you look at other things going on in other communities, it's critical that you remember, this is not a storm. This isn't Hurricane Harvey, where we all had a storm and flooding come through in a very common way. This is a virus that's affecting real people. And all the media, all the data shows us that our, that our minority populations have been impacted more dramatically than other populations. And many people of, of color in our community know direct family members, or others who have been affected. So there is a real fear and concern. And I don't wanna over talk that, but I think it's important for you to understand that we're making decisions in our community to serve the best interest of our entire community. That's why the, we have equity on our list. We have to consider what, it, what e, the, the unique needs of each region of our community as we make our decisions. Of course, we're also carefully considering health and safety the impact on childcare, because I know we have many, many working families in our community, and it's critical that we support those families. Um, someone asked today, well, if we're going to work, how come the, 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 the individuals in the district can be protected and isolated? Why can't they go to work too? Well, I'm gonna be honest. I worked in downtown Houston for 11, the first 11 years of my career in a high rise building. And I can tell you, although I know anyone going into the workplace, is does is at risk and being exposed no one no workplace i was ever in before public education had the risk the full risk of so much exposure outside of perhaps those on the front lines in healthcare educators have the greatest exposure and the greatest risk with hundreds and in some cases thousands of children in a building moving from classroom to classroom and throughout the spaces day to day and we know that despite our best efforts to social distance those children and to keep the staff safe, and no matter how many masks we try to enforce on those children, we know they're still young people. They're still children, all the way down from, to, from high school to elementary, and, and we, we cannot place them at risk because of their youthful indiscretion, nor can we place the adults at risk with so much movement and so much possible exposure with hundreds and potentially thousands of kids coming into a building at any given time, and then leaving the building, again, being the largest employer in the county, we can influence what, how significantly this virus stays or leaves our community. So I want you to have a full appreciation. These are the things that we're thinking about. And I want you to know these are not easy decisions for us because we know we serve these children and we are going to serve them to the best of our ability every single day. But we never forget that any decision we make affects people. It affects the child, it affects their moms and dads, any extended family in their home or that they're connected with, and the greater community that is always at the forefront of every single decision we make. So I want you to trust that we truly are keeping all of that in mind and you might have individual questions and concerns about your unique situation, and we care about that, but, but we have to make decisions to serve the nearly 80,000 students and the greater Fort Bend community. So with that in mind, I'd like to move and talk a little bit about how we plan to start the school year in Fort Bend ISD. The big announcement we made Monday night is that we have determined it's in our best interest of our community to begin school 100% online. Now, there will be some exceptions. There'll be some student groups that will be in the building. For example, some of our special education students, some of our career and technical education students who need labs and specialized equipment and programs, 
and there'll be some other groups, but it'll be a very limited number of students that would actually come to the building for either full day learning or partial day learning. But we, there will be some exceptions. All other students though will be learning 100% online. We'll be scheduling synchronous, which means real time, face-to-face, -face, direct interaction in the, at the same time on the computer with teachers and asynchronous, which is kind of time shifting where students can do work on their own. They can read, watch videos, do work, and then connect with the teacher on a different type of schedule, on a more flexible schedule. But students will engage in both ways. We will continue to provide devices where needed, and we will make special arrangements for students with no internet connectivity at all in their home or area of the community. Extracurricular and co-curricular activities will be on hold. And I mean on hold, that's what I said earlier. Not, I'm not saying these are not going to happen, but they will be on hold while we are learning online. And that's an important piece of our decision because we believe we need to, we need to demonstrate fidelity of, in our decision. If it's not safe for students to gather for learning, then we don't believe it's safe for them to gather on the field or court or marching band field. That does not in any way minimize the importance of those programs. As a, as a former band member myself, as a father of a football player and a yearbook editor, I know how much my boys needed those things and how much it connected them to school, just like your children. And so I just want you to know that's at the forefront of all of our thinking to get our kids fully engaged as soon as we can in those activities. And so we are going to ask, we are asking our coaches and our fine arts staff to continue their work. They should still be engaging online. They should be having workouts for those children to do. They should be meeting with them. They'll meet with them during the athletics periods, during the fine arts periods to continue learning in those areas. It doesn't mean nothing's happening. It means they're learning differently. They may be working out on their own or with a sibling at home or with their parents, but, we, but we are gonna, we're gonna keep moving them forward to the best of our ability, building those relationships while we're online, hoping to get them face-to-face -face on the field by practicing and competing again in the very near future. Another issue that's been very important to our community and to staff are childcare options. Um, next Monday at the board meeting, we're going to talk much more deeply about this. And again, next Wednesday in another live event like this one, we're going to share much more detail about child care options for our own staff and for and employees who are going to be teaching, as well as for our community members. So we're going to be leveraging our extended learning programs, as well as other options in our community to be able um, to support child care needs for those who, who need those situations, who need us to help with that. Um, the other thing that's critical is some have asked about the uh, pre-registration we have mentioned. I want you to know that we do plan to be online for the foreseeable future. Today, we don't know how long that will be. Um, even today, the, um, the state issued a new order. The governor has shared plans to allow us to stay closed longer than the three weeks he initially, that was initially published by TEA. So it could be longer. It will, it will likely be longer than three weeks based on the guidance of our local um, health authorities are at the, at the county level. And so just know we are already working very closely with them at the county and they're part of our advisory team that's working with us with many other physicians in our area to help us make the best decisions. So we, again, we'll be meeting regularly with them and, and we'll, we'll, we'll make that decision later as to when we'll face-to-face -face will resume. But before we do bring any students in face-to-face, -face, that's when we will do the pre-registration. So we are not gonna do the same planned pre-registration in, in July that we were planning since we know we're gonna be online for a period of time, but we will allow plenty of runway for parents to make the choice to continue online or return face-to-face and for our staff to respond to build the school schedules and the face-to-face -face schedules when we determine it's appropriate. Another question that I heard today that 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 uh, that I, I, I that I guess I, I really empathize with, I'll put it that way, is um, we don't want to keep starting and stopping, and from week to week making a decision, changing a decision. We, we need to be able to think longitudinally. We want our students to know to the full extent possible how long they're going to be online 
and when we hope to resume. The hard part about that, and this is where I'm asking our parents is to do your best to help your children through this season, is we don't know from week to week right now. We, we want to be able to make decisions long term and we're going to do our very best to make announcements that are out in time for implementation, not this is starting next week, because that's not good for families, nor is it good for our staff. So we're going to be doing some long, longer term planning, um, and again, in tandem with the county. But I just want you to know we're sensitive to the fact that our children, it's hard on them to, to desperately want to go back into their school and activities and then to consistently hear, well, not yet and not yet. So I, my, my, right now what I'm saying is we don't know when, how long we're going to be online, but we will give plenty of advance notice to the best of our ability when we think that might change. One of the other questions that has come through consistently in the last few days and even before now was how is the fall online learning gonna look different than, than it did in the spring? Because we can all agree our teachers work hard and we did our very best in the spring. But when we come back in the fall, we have got to take grades and we have to have a rigorous learning program in place. And we're dedicated to making that happen. So I'm gonna talk about three categories in regard to our improved online experience for the fall. First of all, as I've already mentioned, we will have scheduled live real-time instruction, synchronous instruction via video conferencing tools. We're changing up some of our tools so that all teachers will have a consistent application of those tools um, across the board. We will also have daily asynchronous learning for our students. Um, we'll have streamlined technology tools to support consistency and student engagement, as I mentioned. That's one of the most important things right now is getting all of our teachers using the same equipment in the same way. Uh, I want to go back to the term daily on this slide as well. Because one of the things that's very critical every parent understand is that all of the usual compulsory attendance rules and laws are in effect this fall. We have no latitude from the state to not educate all students every single day. So students will be expected to be learning every day, whether it's synchronously or in real time or asynchronously on a flexible schedule. They will use the tools we provide, Schoology and the online video tools, as well as another, a couple of other new systems we're going to be rolling out so that we can track daily growth and progress through our student learning. So it's just critical that you begin to set the expectations with your students that they will do school every day. Some will actually be in face-to-face -face classes with their teacher for several hours a day, two to three to even maybe four hours a day. Now, of course, that's our older children. Our younger children will be in class with their face-to-face -face for an hour to two or 90 minutes perhaps a day based on the age of the child. We're going to adapt all of that based on their age and ability, but just know no matter what, they need to be doing school every single day. And we're going to have to document that to the TEA to be able to be funded for serving your children. So please keep that in mind as we roll, as you hear, as you begin thinking about how the new school will begin. Um, you, Schoology is a system that is a very powerful, it's a robust system that we've implemented. We're going into our fourth year. Um, but we do know the way it was used in the spring was sporadic. Many staff used it very differently. So we are going to have a standardized, improved course organization um, so that all students are experiencing the same experience, having the same experience with all of their teachers. And so that parents can have a common understanding of how the system is being used as well as they're supporting their children. We're also going to have a standardized communication system for parents in Schoology, as well as the calendar and Schoology gradebook features for progress monitoring. So the theme you can see building so far is we are gonna use our tools differently in a more aligned and standardized way to improve the overall experience. And we're gonna have much more direct instruction. In regard to progress monitoring and feedback, we are gonna do formative assessments to check for daily student progress through interactive tools. And I've mentioned that um, we're also going to have consistent and ongoing feedback within Schoology and grading practices will go back to how they were last year before COVID-19, before the pandemic. 
So the usual policy around grading will stand. Grades will be issued as usual and students will be held accountable for making progress through their work. I wanted to talk a little bit more about synchronous and asynchronous because we talk about this term and we've been debating about this term because synchronous and asynchronous, they're kind of specialized terms that are used in and outside of technology. They're used in technology, education and other areas. But since the state is using these terms, we wanted to make sure we have a common definition and what this looks like in Fort Bend. So remote synchronous instruction is two way real time live. If you and I were synchronous right now, we're talking, well, I'm talking to you and you're listening. But if this were a classroom setting, the student would be able to see me and talk to me at the same time when the students are not on campus. Synchronous instruction includes direct teaching, explicit teaching, modeling of concepts, showing examples, doing modeling for students. It means collaborative activities, the teacher and the student doing things together, students doing things together as well as they're pairing up through the, through the online portal to be able to uh, visit with, the, with their classmates. Formative assessment and progress monitoring. Teachers will be able to assess students in real time synchronously. Also just conferring, conferencing with students and, and giving small, small group instruction. The teacher, just as she does in the classroom, might ask a small group of students to go into a special breakout room to work on a concept where they need extra help. So we, we can do many of the same things we can do in a classroom um, synchronously using our online tools. Now, on the, uh, as opposed, on the other side is remote asynchronous. So this is where the instruction does not require having the instructors and the students engaged at the same time. In this case, um, they, the, this teacher might post something, record something and make it available to the students. And then the students would practice and create their own content using the assignment that the teacher gives them. Um, the students might collaborate and give feedback with each other using digital tools while the teacher's not directly engaged with them or they have opportunities for students to demonstrate understanding. They might make a video, write a paper, um, draw, build a model, do something to demonstrate their understanding, again, when they're not directly engaged with the teacher. And then the students will be able to do self-assessment and set goals as well. We will use both of these in a very robust way in our classrooms this fall. On Monday, the board considered, and I want to say the word considered very carefully, we, we had an initial recommendation from the administration um, to change the calendar for the 2021 school year. But as we got into the meeting, we, as we talked more and more about opening school online and all the things going on in our community right now and in our state, we realized that it would be premature to modify the calendar. So as of today, the calendar is still scheduled to begin school on August 12th. Teachers will report and begin their teacher learning on August 5th to prepare um, for students to return. So as of now, the, the calendar posted online, the calendar that was adopted back in January is the school year calendar. Now it's possible it could be modified again based on um, COVID-19, the pandemic, as we make more decisions. But as of today, that you can rely on the school year starting on the 12th. If that changes in any way, we will, we will let you know, of course, in all the usual channels and there'll be very public information and conversation about that. As we begin school online, I wanna make sure um, that we're very clear that teachers will deliver instruction from the classroom or a designated workspace within the school. This is something that we've heard a lot of questions from teachers about, about why we're asking this of them. Um, and so in my response to the teachers that I've talked to is, what we found in the, in the spring is that when teachers don't have the professional environment, when they don't have the tools, the resources, all the things they need around them that you have in a typical classroom, it made the student experience inconsistent because you just simply cannot move everything home and deliver instruction in the same way you would with all the, the tools and resources. So, so we believe our students will be best served by asking teachers to come into the classroom 
where they can set up and do their thing in their classrooms and their workspace. If at, at some places there may be two teachers in a large room divided with, you know, with health and safety protocols in place or something like that. We don't know yet how it's all going to be, how everyone will be stationed, but we do, we are asking all staff to return to the building to deliver instruction. Of course, when it comes to consistency and effectiveness, monitoring practices are allowed, we can then have our administrators performing their role to be in the building, monitoring, supporting teachers, supporting families, as well in real time um, as, as, we're, as learning is taking place from the building. So, I, but I also wanna reinforce, we reference the health and safety protocols here in a very important way, because we are going to make sure that we have systems in place to allow staff to come into the building without contacting others, to get to their rooms and their space without contacting others, to make sure that they're protected. Now, we know there would be exceptions based on documented health risk for some, but I'm gonna go through health protocols in just a minute, but we are gonna ask staff to return to buildings to deliver instruction um, for the reasons I've stated. Um, teacher professional learning will build capacity to deliver instruction in a virtual environment. I wanted to bring this up because I, I'm hearing questions from teachers about, well, okay, when I come back to start the school year, am I gonna have to sit in all the usual PD and the meetings and those things? And the answer is yes, you'll be in some trainings, but the start of school will look very, very different. From the day teachers report, they will be focused on learning what online instruction will look like, planning their lessons, practicing using the tools, practicing delivering those lessons, and getting ready to start the year. So they'll be focusing on it. So all of the training will focus on equipping teachers to implement the learning framework online. We're also going to focus on building those technology skills for virtual instruction. And we're going to be providing teachers lots of time to plan instruction, develop virtual materials, and set up communication in Schoology course organization. Um, so I just want you to know that's where the bulk of your time is going to be spent um, when you return to work um, to launch the new school year. So, and we're, we're not going to have a major convocation event this year, which disappoints me uh, and some of you, but some of you it won't disappoint at all. We'll have a, some kind of inspiring greeting for everyone that will be very brief, but our focus will be preparing to launch the new school year. Face-to-face -face student groups will be phased into the building over time. This kind of comes back to what I said earlier. I'm not saying not never, I'm saying not now. And as I mentioned, we will phase students back in. So once we determine it is safe, return to the, safe to return to the buildings for face-to-face -face instruction, at that time, we'll begin to bring in groups in, smaller groups of students. And I can't identify right now what size those groups would be but I do know we'll, it'll be relative to the size of the building, the number of staff and the number of students in that building. But what we want to do is allow all the teachers and the faculty in the building to master um, the health and safety protocols and then educate the students in regard to the health and safety protocols in small groups as they learn to navigate the building and their learning in a new way. Once phasing is complete, that's when we will launch in back um, extra and co-curricular activities once we resume face-to-face -face instruction. So there, there will be a relationship between face-to-face -face instruction and when we resume our, our activities in our building. Um, I'm hopeful that UIL will provide guidance that aligns with what we're doing, that maybe they would delay the start of some of the seasons to allow the, because there are many districts who are starting online other than Fort Bend who are doing exactly what we're doing. And so I hope that they will consider that as they might do what some of the professional leagues are doing and do a modified football season or a modified late start volleyball season, the fall, you know, some of those things for the fall sports as well as the fine arts activities that take place in the fall. Um, due to the social distancing protocols and teacher availability, cap and overflow will continue at all campuses with enrollment management plans as previously shared. This is a common question we're getting from Ridge Point High School um, from Siena Crossing, from some of the other schools that are currently capped and overflowed due to enrollment growth this fall. So yes, the, the cap and overflow will continue as scheduled. Now, what that means though, 
is that for a student who's currently enrolled in Ridgepoint, they will either be an online or face-to-face -face at the appropriate time student at Ridgepoint High School. And when the time comes to make an opt to choose, if they choose online, they're still a Ridgepoint student. They do not lose their seat at the school as some parents are asking. The only, so, but if a student who is new to the area goes to enroll at Ridgepoint and they live outside of the two mile walk radius, they will be asked to enroll at Hightower High School and be an online or face-to-face -face student served at Hightower High School. Now, if you as a parent, or if you're attending a school, if, you're that, if you currently in, attend a school or have a seat at a school that is in cap and overflow and you choose to um, disenroll to remove your student from the school to go to a private school, to homeschool them, to remove them from the FBISD system, you will lose your seat at that school. And when you come back in the future to re-enroll in Fort Bend at that same school, the rules would apply to you as if you were a new student moving into the community, whatever is in place at that time. And again, the two mile walk radius applies where students who live within that radius are allowed to enroll at the cap and overflow schools. But if you're outside of the two mile radius, that would, that would affect you and you would be asked to go to the overflow campus. I want to be very clear about that because we're receiving several questions. So we're also going to update our website with that information during the next day or two. I've talked a great deal about our overall instructional program, but some of the questions we're getting right now have to do with our special student populations, our GT kiddos, our special needs students, our English language learners. So I've asked Dina Hill, Dr. Dina Hill, She's our executive director over all of our special student populations. And I've asked her to come and share just a few comments directly with you about how we handle, how to address the needs of these very special groups of students. Well, good evening and thank you, Dr. Dupree. You know, I wanna take a few minutes this evening to address some of the questions that we've been receiving in our office from parents and even from, from some of our staff members regarding our students served with special services. First of all, I'd like to start off and talk about our students served with special ed services. You know, as Dr. Dupree mentioned, as we focus on equity and health and safety and social emotional needs, we have a lot of individual decisions to make regarding students served with special ed services. That being said, we know that we're gonna need to have ARD meetings for each student. Um, some of these meetings can, can be held in an amendment to the ARD and some may require an actual ARD meeting that would be held virtually. So beginning the week of July 27th, our campus staff will be contacting parents to schedule these meetings and to set up a time to discuss how we'll implement the special ed services in the various models that Dr. Dupree has discussed tonight. First of all, we'll need to talk about virtual instruction. And I know that a lot of parents had concerns with the way that we provided instruction, especially our special ed services during the virtual environment in the spring. And as we've worked collaboratively to ensure that our teachers had been provided training as we work on the synchronous instruction and asynchronous, we also know that we need to provide different levels of services, special ed services during this time. So during the ARD meetings, we'll be talking about what will uh, special ed services look like during synchronous instruction, and then what, what might we do and support kids during asynchronous instruction. We also know that there are some students, a, a small portion of students who are served with the special ed services who do not do well in a virtual environment. And as Dr. Dupree alluded to earlier, there will be students that we believe we need to serve in a face-to-face -face environment. So through that ARD process, we'll consider certain criteria and for some students, that face-to-face -face model will be more appropriate. And so as we work through the ARD process, each campus principal will be working to determine who are the students that do need to come in for face-to-face -face instruction and then they will be developing a phase staggered entry for those students too. So if a particular campus has 40 or 50 students across the board at a high school, how they phase in the students um, with disabilities that will need the face-to-face -face might look a little bit different than another school that has a less amount of students. So I don't wanna say that every single student that served face-to-face -face through special ed services would start on August 12th, 
but the goal would be to start those face-to-face -face services uh, around when school starts. And then as we stagger kids in, um, you know, we'll be supporting them. And, and I think the most important piece to that is to get teacher input, those special ed teachers who know how to work with our students and also consider the health and safety needs as we bring students into the classroom. So those are the things that we're gonna be doing for the ARD process. In addition, we've been working with our special ed parent advisory uh, group, and we've been having focus group meetings and getting their input to really better understand how we can uh, improve this, the services during this time. We will be providing additional communication next week in the form of written communication coming through emails, as well as an additional video that really speaks more about special ed services. We want parents to know where they can go to get help. And so we'll be providing information about where to go on the website. We also will provide information about how do we continue special ed evaluations during this time. And ultimately our parents serve with special ed student uh, services can choose to stay in that virtual environment or if it's appropriate, we will have kids in the face-to-face -face environment. So next I wanna talk about our gifted learners. So many of our parents um, that have students serve with gifted services have asked questions about how will gifted services be provided? Will they be provided in the online environment? And so I wanna say absolutely yes, we will be provided GT services. Our students will be clustered in that virtual environment, similar to how they were clustered in the face-to-face -face environment back at school. Um, so, you know, if there are six students in a classroom, we'll continue to make intentional decisions about how we place students in classroom, in virtual classrooms, so that they will be able to interact and work with students, other students that are gifted learners. The other thing that we've really worked hard on is how we're, is the instructional content and how we're delivering that instruction. We've been working um, to ensure that we provide, last summer, I mean, last spring, we rolled out um, our instruction via the online environment and we used a term called extensions. And we realized that that term did not really clearly communicate what we were trying to do. And so what we have, um, revised is that terminology and so teachers will be connecting with parents to ensure that curricular alternatives will be provided for our students. So if we have a student who's receiving gifted uh, services or a student in general that really is already proficient and understands uh, uh, the, the content and, and an assignment, we certainly do not want that student to just have to do that assignment. So we would provide a curricular alternative that would give the student an alternative assignment. So instead of giving the student you know, more of the same, they would have different and meaningful assignments um, in the form of those curricular alternatives. And also with GT, I think it's gonna be really important that our parents understand that the instructional day will include that synchronous time where students can work with other gifted students on their project-based um, you know, assignments as well as work on their TPSP. I mean, those are the times that we've built into this calendar that we have synchronous and asynchronous time to allow that interaction between the gifted learners. Again, additional communication will be coming out next week for our parents. Um, we will be hearing from our GT director, Dr. Westfall, and she'll be talking a little bit more in that video and communication about how we will provide GT identification during the virtual time. Um, how will we provide, uh, how will mentorship program, the GT mentorship program work um, as we're online and other important information so that you, you can uh, feel like, you know, you can have more information and know that your GT student will be served appropriately. And then lastly, I just want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about our English, le our English learners. Um, certainly, we've been working on that curriculum as well to ensure that it's linguistically accommodated and so that our students have access to the curriculum. We've been providing additional training for our teachers and ensuring that they have the tools to support that instruction um, so that our students can access the curriculum. For our bilingual learners, we want to make sure that the tools that 
teachers have and that students have access to is in Spanish as appropriate, depending on the bilingual model that, you know, for the, for the student, and that we also embed those L supports into the instruction. Again, teacher training is key here to ensure that our teachers have what they need to, um, to provide that instruction in that virtual environment. So these are just a few things, uh, Dr. Dupree, that we're working on for our students serve with special in special populations. Again, um, additional communication is coming and we wanna make sure parents do know who to go to and where to go to to get a, a support and additional information. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I appreciate all your team's hard work to, to make that happen for our special kids. Um, I do want to go back before I move on to health and safety and just reinforce, I've, I've got a note in the chat from one of my staff saying that I need to reinforce the idea that compulsory attendance is in effect. I think I mentioned that, but I think just as we transition, I do want to reinforce again that school is not optional and that students will be expected to engage every single day in the learning environment. And so I just wanted to make sure all that you were preparing our mindset for that, that our students are getting prepared for that, that they may be going to school online, but they will be going to school every, every single day. So with that in mind, we are beginning online, but as I mentioned, we do plan to transition into the workplace um, soon, you know, our students back into the classroom soon. In the meantime, however, all of our district staff are in the process and are returning to work. As you can see, I'm in my office. I'm coming to the office more regularly. Many staff members are transitioning back to the workplace and we're doing so with very tight health and safety guidelines in place. Now, as I begin this conversation and present on these few items though, I want, to, I, want to know, I want you to know, I've gotten some emails from some parents and from staff telling me that, well, you say these things are happening, but I've been to a school and I saw some of those people not wearing masks and I saw them um, too close to other people and I saw them not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And that's a problem because inconsistency causes a lack of trust. So we're gonna have high accountability in our organization for anyone that's working, including me, to wear a mask when I'm out and about in the building, when I'm going to the restroom, when I'm doing things, grabbing my coffee, you know, from the coffee room. There's, we have to be very mindful of every single action that we do, people are watching, and that we place others at risk if we're not taking, if we're not attentive to doing that, what we're being asked to do. So I wanna talk a little bit about where we're headed with health and safety. Right now, our focus is education. Um, our health advisory team that we're working with, we have a number of physicians, as I mentioned before, who are specialists in infection control, critical care. Um, we have some child psychologists, some child psychiatrists. We have individuals who do infection control as their full-time job, who lead that effort in some of the largest hospitals in our community. And I'm pleased that we have these individuals on our team because they're helping us to develop our health and safety protocols and giving us good guidance and feedback on our work. So I appreciate their efforts. At one point, some point in the future, we will recognize them publicly for what they're doing. But our health and safety protocols are, we're, we're developing some documents and we're developing a training a campaign, a communication and training campaign that will roll out next week because we do need everybody to start getting that in their mindset around health and safety to protect themselves and others. Like our students, as I mentioned, staff will be phased back into the workplace over the coming weeks as we start to begin school. Now, as we think about students returning at some point in the future, I know it's on the minds of many of our teachers that, well, I, I'm gonna be a teacher, but I know I'm gonna to have to also be involved with a lot of health and, and safety work. And the answer that I have for all of our teachers when they ask about this is, we are not placing the burden of health and safety on the backs of our teachers. They will not be expected to perform all health and safety functions. Now, as all of us, we're all gonna be expected to hold others accountable to do our part. And if I use the copier machine in my office, I'm gonna spray it and wipe it and do my part to make sure my, I don't leave a mark that I was there for the people who come after me. All of us are gonna be asked to do that on multiple levels. So just know where it's all of us, it's gonna take all of us. But we are gonna hire wellness monitors. I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute, but we're gonna have wellness monitors at each of our work sites who are responsible 
for doing some for taking care of the function of health and safety. We're also going to hire additional staff where needed and contract services for cleaning and different things. So we're not just going to ask people who already have full time jobs to take on more responsibilities. We are going to, um, but we are going to hire some additional staff. We are, though, I will. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that point. Um, go back, please. I'll go back to the previous slide. The thing I want you to appreciate, as I mentioned, proactive and precautionary measures are critical for all staff at all locations. I want every person, whether they're a bus driver in a bus terminal, to a custodian, to a cafeteria worker, to a teacher, to a principal, to anyone in central admin, I want everyone to understand whatever your job is, all of these things apply to you and you will be held accountable and we expect you to hold others accountable for their actions as well. As I mentioned, we plan to hire wellness monitors and we will be performing wellness checks. Now the wellness monitors, they're intended to support implementation of health and safety protocols. Um, they, they will be assigned to campuses and, and office buildings based on need. So a campus with a larger staff or a larger enrollment will have multiple, they'll have more. But we're gonna come up with that allocation to make sure they can perform their job with fidelity and execute to do their job well without being themselves being overtaxed and overstressed. So I am just gonna put in a little plug that in the near future, we're gonna be posting this job. And if you're a part-time person, if you have a background in healthcare and you don't have to have that, but if there's something that you're doing um, either part-time or if you're not a working individual right now, whether you're unemployed full-time or you've chosen to, to not work and you'd like an opportunity full-time or part-time, there will be opportunities to come work in our schools as wellness, monitor, as wellness monitors and in our office building. So look for that job posting on FBISD, on the Fort Bend ISD website, um, because we, we're going to need to hire a lot of people very quickly um, to be able to get this, get this position activated. We all, just for some of you, though, who've asked me about your job, for example, bus drivers, while we're fully online, all of our bus drivers may not be working full time. Some are asking about educational assistance, what their job is going to be. We may ask some of you to transition your skills into a wellness monitor so that you can have a, a job to function in in Fort Bend ISD to retain pay, to keep you busy, keep you working as part of our team. Because we don't want to lose team members during this time. We want our team members to feel productive and to be a part of our effort to support our students in an ongoing way. So we'll, we'll ask some people to transition into that opportunity and we will be hiring as well. Um, as well. So um, all of our staff, just so you know, we have our, through, our, through our United Healthcare Wellness Plan, we have the Live Well Health Screening. And we're gonna ask all of, our, all of our staff members daily to complete that screening before they report to work. The purpose of that screening is to indicate whether you're demonstrating any symptoms, just the mindfulness to check yourself, or do you, are you demonstrating any of the symptoms of COVID-19 before you come to work? And if you are, you will be asked to stay home and call your supervisor and HR and seek medical care. Um, students will also have a mechanism when they come into the building, when we begin to bring students into the building, they'll be doing non-contact temperature checks and they'll and students if that if they are if they have a fever through that temperature check they'll be redirected to a designated area for further assessment, and the parents will be contacted immediately um, to meet the needs of their child to pick them up. Um, any visitor coming into the building will also be checked upon entry, and in any individual posing any risk at all will be expected to leave immediately. Some of the other aspects of health and safety are the things you've heard about regularly for the last several months. Hand washing, we will have routine hand washing. We'll expect staff to wash their hands routinely, as well as students and visitors. Um, we'll have, um, you know, we'll have, everybody will be trained and monitored. We'll have required hand washing at certain times, such as after students have moved throughout the building, maybe they've touched doorknobs or been to the lunchroom. And hand, sanitize, hand sanitizer and portable hand washing stations will also be throughout the building. Uh, and so every so there will always be availability to cleanse your hands appropriately if you cannot get to a sink with soap and water. Face coverings will be expected of all visitors, all staff, and all students at all times. 
Now, when I'm in my office alone, like I am right now, I will take my mask off. But if anybody comes into my space or I go to theirs, that mask will be on. That applies to all of us, any public area and classrooms, except on a limited occasion, which will be identified for health need. There will be exceptions for medical condition. But this applies to, again, all students, all staff, and all visitors. We are looking at investing in the plastic face shields for, many, for our youngest learners who are going to struggle with the mask. We know it's going to be a challenge for many students. It's a challenge for many adults. So we are looking at face shields in addition to masks and face other fabric face coverings. The district will provide face coverings for students and staff, although anybody is encouraged to bring their own if there's one that they find most comfortable that they would prefer to wear. Um, and of course, we're gonna be training everyone on the proper wear, care, and cleaning. And as I mentioned earlier, there will always be exceptions for any documented medical condition. When it comes to social distancing, we'll be maintaining a minimum of six feet in common areas and classroom spaces. All staff will be trained to enforce um, social distancing in common areas. That's all staff. Anybody will be empowered to redirect students or other adults who are not, who are not six feet apart. Class sizes, and, any, and when we resume face-to-face, -face, will be based on one student to 45 square foot of space in a room. So what that looks like in some classrooms, for example, in some of our brand new schools, they're, they're built to the new TEA standard of 800 square feet per classroom. That would translate to 16 students and one teacher in the room. In a smaller, older classroom in some of our older buildings that are gonna be smaller or a specialized classroom, it could be as few as eight students with one teacher or 14. So that's gonna look very different from school to school and from classroom to classroom based on the size of the classroom. We'll be working all of that out before we bring any students into our building. Um, designated building entrances will be used to control traffic flow and there'll be no congregating in the hallways or common areas. So as, as you can see, this is one of the reasons we feel it's necessary to begin online is because when you get to secondary school, it's impossible to social distance when you're having passing periods. So we just believe right now it, it creates a congregating issue to have too many students in the building attempting to go through the regular day. Now, as I mentioned, we are working on solutions that, are, that we hope are going to help us open more quickly um, for students who want to come to school for face-to-face. -face. We'll be working on those things and announcing some of those things in the near future. Um, we're gonna take many measures to reduce surface contact. For example, we may not use water fountains. Students may have their own water bottles as opposed to touching a common water fountain. In regard to social distancing, we're also gonna limit all face-to-face -face meetings for staff. Staff will do their professional learning communities. They'll do their various work in distance using digital tools um, when at all possible. Um, online teachers and those at risk will be provided contact-free entrance into the buildings and to the workplace. This is a very important piece because we know um, some students have, some staff have expressed concern about returning to the buildings. But as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a very structured coming and going, scheduled use of break rooms, scheduled use of work rooms, those kind of things to provide about, to bring the, um, to, to, to provide them the support and safety and security. Classrooms and other doors should, will be manned or opened by the teacher when possible to limit contact with doorknobs. Um, I just got a message in chat reminding me in terms of if any students or staff choose to bring their own um, face covering, it does need to be compliant with our dress code. Nothing that's going to cause a disruption in the learning environment over messaging or any type of image that might be on that. Cleaning protocols, again, this is something that we get a lot of questions about is how are we cleaning our buildings? So comprehensive cleaning protocols will follow CDC, TEA, and OSHA guidelines. There will be continuous cleaning throughout the day with an emphasis on high traffic, high exposure areas, and high touch surfaces. Right now, our custodians typically clean at the end of the day. They're gonna begin cleaning continuously, which means we'll be adding staff, whether it be direct um, hired staff or, or contracted staff by a contracted organization. 
but we are going to make sure things are cleaned regularly throughout the day. Um, we will provide appropriate cleaning supplies throughout the building for immediate spot cleaning by all staff and students when necessary. Um, a big question we're getting right now is about air filtration. We are working on an air filtration plan um, that will have and we'll share more details about that in the near future. Again, that's something we need to be able to share in detail with our staff and with our parents before they make decisions about coming into the building. Um, but we are we are working with that and we're going to make sure we communicate details about our, our, our excuse me, our air filtration plan during the coming weeks. I also want to make sure everyone is aware that all disinfectants used in our building are rated as effective against COVID-19. Per CDC guidelines, and this is important for the elementary kiddos, um, outdoor play structures will not be disinfected. Playgrounds will be closed until further notice. But what that means is we're going to be, when we come back face to face, we'll be using playground coordinators, again, some, another hired position, to, to handle recess that would be properly socially distanced without play structures while still allowing active movement and unstructured play. We, don't, we want to do everything we can to help our students get those brain breaks and that running and the time they need during recess to kind of unwind from the classroom. As we, re as we return to work, I want our staff to know and our parents to know that um, per CDC and TEA guidelines, classrooms or buildings might be closed for a period of time for cleaning and disinfection. So each campus and workspace will have a COVID crisis team that's led by the wellness monitor. Um, there'll be other staff members, but if there's any diagnosed cases, we will do contact tracing and, that, and we'll do that in conjunction with the county as we already do to make sure that everything is documented and that we are able to get in contact with anyone who may have been exposed to the diagnosed individual. We will follow all CDC, TEA and county guidelines for reporting diagnosed and suspected cases, including protocols to support notification of parents and the school community. Now, we already have some guidelines set up for our staff. We have an incident reporting protocol for anyone that finds that they were in close contact, demonstrate symptoms, or test positive for COVID-19. Self-quarantine is required if a staff member exhibits symptoms or if they're in close contact, if they become, if they were in close contact with someone who tested positive for the virus. That's self-quarantine, that's a 14-day period where you step away and to make sure that you, that you are not, um, that you do not have the virus and it does not become symptomatic in you. Self-isolation occurs if you actually have a test positive for the virus. And that's different than the self-quarantine because it lasts potentially longer because the, the timing, you begin to count time after you are no longer symptomatic. So there's the, we have detailed plans in place for protocol for incident reporting and for self-quarantine and self-isolation when if and when that should occur in the workplace. Um, during self-quarantine and self-isolation, staff may work from home if they're able to fulfill their job responsibilities. So that's important because we don't want our staff having to use leave time unless it's absolutely necessary. So you'll be allowed to perform your job from home if you're in a self-quarantine or self-isolation situation. If, however, you're unable to fulfill your job responsibilities, you will have to use available leave options. And there are multiple. We have the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provides leave. We also have local and state leave, as well as our catastrophic leave bank and our elective leave bank in, that's in policy. So you have multiple choices that you would need there. All of this information is online. And then you'll also need to work with HR if this, if this becomes something that you need to deal with. But we, are, we, are, we really want to support you and help you minimize the amount of leave that, we, that you might need to use. So in closing the actual presentation for this evening, I just want to get a preview of where we're headed. This week, we talked to the board about all of this information I've just shared with you. We presented preliminary instructional expectations and health and safety protocols. And we are opening staff feedback on health and safety protocols tomorrow using thought exchange. So staff, we want our staff to weigh in 
on the health and safety protocols as they return to the, the we want their feedback to make sure we're meeting their needs and so that they can feel safe to return. And so look for that email um, staff tomorrow. Near term, beginning next week, we're gonna further refine all of this information and continue to roll out information through school board meetings beginning Monday and live events like this next Wednesday on the 22nd and using the other channels like email, videos, and, and our usual push systems through your text messaging and those kinds of things. Um, we're gonna talk more about how instructional expectations, social emotional supports, and our operational systems. Health and safety education communications campaign will begin next week and we're begin, gonna begin student enrollment verification next week. Now that is different than the pre-registration we previously discussed. We're not gonna begin that since we're beginning online, but we are gonna ask all parents to do the usual student enrollment verification earlier than usual, because we are gonna need as part of that verification, we need clear information about each student's uh, access to technology, whether they have broadband, um, Wi-Fi, um, internet connectivity in their homes. Uh, so we're gonna need that information sooner than usual so that we can get those tools in the student's hands as quickly as possible before the first day of school. So be looking for that student enrollment verification to begin next week. Um, Long-term, we're gonna develop the bell schedules, the plans for how we're gonna use our buildings, co coordinate the school schedule for online learning. Um, and we're also gonna begin thinking about busing for kids who are coming to school, how we're gonna distribute the technology to students who need that, those kinds of things. And then of course, teachers begin professional learning First day of school is scheduled for August 12th. And then at the beginning of the school year, this year, excuse me, we're going to um, assess each student very carefully through, um, through the usual systems to make sure that we're meeting their needs in the classroom, that they have the right class assignment for all their classes and courses and grade levels, and to see what specialized interventions they might require to make sure we're addressing any learning gaps that resulted from last spring. And of course, all of this will be going through the continuous cycle of improvement and communication as we always do. So that is the presentation I had for you and it did take a little longer than expected. I apologize for that. So we're gonna get right into the questions and Deanna um, is here with me to respond to some of these questions. So let's, let's go ahead and get into these. Um, so there's a general question from Donna, a parent. Can you please address how the county's risk level will affect the opening and closing of schools. What protocols will be in place if a student or staff member tests positive for COVID-19? How will changes in schedule or the mode of instructional delivery be communicated to stakeholders? So as I mentioned earlier, we are, especially today, as the governor has made new announcements of giving authority to the county health officials to um, open and close schools or to call for online learning, we're gonna be working very closely with the county as we already have been. But now that they have that authority, we're gonna keep in very tight alignment with them to set up, we, we've been talking about what the triggers are um, and, and what, the, what the numbers would be that indicate it's safe or not safe to have students congregating in our buildings. And as I mentioned, we do have the protocols um, in, in place. I've, I've discussed some of those in detail and you'll get much more detail as students um, would come back into the building, but we have them in place for staff members, as I've already mentioned, about the reporting, self-isolating, and self-quarantining. So I think I've answered a good deal of this question already. Um, but how will the, the the changes will all be will also be announced well in advance, and parents will be given time to respond to any of those changes, as well as making an election to continue online or coming back into school. Was there a survey done, and did they ask parents if this is what they wanted to do? Did they give parents options? So this is a question that's come up quite a bit in the last few days. At this point, um, we're basing our decisions on the survey we did in early June. And so that is driving a great deal. So, so all parents have the opportunity to engage in the survey as well as staff at that time. So we're using that data. We had about 17,000 responses. So we believe it's very reliable information that we're using to make our decisions. We have not conducted another broad-based survey since then although we have asked staff some questions about their, about their level of safety, feeling of safety coming back into the workplace. So we are gonna come back at some point 
and ask parents to declare whether they want their child to continue online or return into the classroom. Um, so, but that's where we are at this point. Also, um, why didn't you consider opening the schools later instead of starting online? So that there's a couple of thoughts about that, and we're and we're actually still debating honestly whether we might want to postpone a little longer. We haven't had that conversation publicly with the board yet, um, so I want to be careful about how much I talk about that because we do need to have that discussion. Um, but we are considering whether we need to make a recommendation to the board to postpone to allow students just and staff to not be committed to school to maybe get the, get to see if we if the pandemic spikes and then begins to settle, which could get us back into school, more students face-to-face -face sooner, or if there, or if we prefer, if the community and the board thinks it would be better to go ahead and begin school online. Because I would point out, one of the reasons we're starting online is because we are gonna have to close school at some point because of the community spread. Whether it be all schools, one school, or a wing, or a classroom, we need our teachers and our students well educated in how to use the online tools. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to go ahead and start online anyway, is to make sure everyone is prepared. So then when we have to quickly pivot later on in the year, we're able to do so. This is one of the ways we're transforming our organization is we need all those tools and resources. They need to be handy. They need to be ready to use them on a moment's notice. So that that's a critical piece of that decision. Although we are getting questions about, well, are teachers going to be well prepared? And I addressed that during the presentation. We believe we can prepare them by using our back to school days differently. We want them to be well prepared. We want them to be planned and ready to execute on the first day of school. But of course, like anything, there's going to be startup time, ramp up time, the relationship building time, which is so critical as well. And so there's a lot involved in starting school as of today, August 12th is the day. And if that does change, we will let you know as soon as possible in a big broad communication to make sure everyone is aware. Deanna, did you have anything else to add on that topic? Well, well what I would say is that um, even as we're starting school online, um, we are working uh, as we did when we started in the spring um, as a, a gradual opening of school in terms of developing a culture in a classroom as Dr. Dupree said, teachers, as they work synchronously with students, helping them get acclimated to the daily schedule, um, working with them um, to create routines for the synchronous time that they're going to be together um, and, and having them get to know their peers. Um, all of those things can still occur in an online environment. And so as we ramp up that online platform, we will begin to use some of the same strategies that we might have used in a face-to-face -face environment to address those social emotional needs with our students and really acclimate them to how to function proficiently in that online platform. So. Thank you. Yep, that's good stuff. How does the district plan to address social distancing at the bus and at the bus stop? So this is one of the most important topics we're working on because the, you know, and we don't know, we're gonna talk much more about the operational pieces like buses at the next Monday's board meeting. And so we will we'll make sure to, um, to share that information because that is something we have to be mindful that students, if they're not monitored at a bus stop, might take risks that we don't want them to take that are not appropriate. So we are gonna to have to be very careful about that. Um, what are the school changes for air filters, classroom cleanliness? Jessica asked that question. Carmen, a parent, asked the previous question. Jessica, another parent, is asking. I've spoken to how a great deal. We've got we've got a whole book that we're going to be using on, uh, procedures on cleaning and those kinds of things. And I've mentioned we are studying our air, air filters as well to make sure that we're having the cleanest, um, most virus-free um, environment possible. When will the district give parents more information on how online learning will run? All of that information will roll out as we begin to start school during the coming weeks. So as I mentioned, we're gonna start a health and safety campaign. Shortly after that, sometime in later July, August, we'll be starting to share videos and important information about what it looks like and means to engage online. We're gonna be working um, in, to produce many of those videos that are translated to different languages this year to make sure we're meeting the needs of all of our students. Um, Deanna, do you have anything else to add on that on that question about online learning? 
Well, I would say that we're also going to create robust um, resources for our parents uh, because we know that um, many parents um, will will continue to assist their students as they work through the online platform, um, whether asynchronously or synchronously. So um, along with working with students uh, daily in those platforms, we will be posting and providing um, resources for parents because we know that our parents will, will need those as they as they work through the online system. Absolutely. So why didn't the district allow parents to complete the registration process the week of July 7th mentioned in other FBISD communications before deciding to make the start of school online for all students? This is a question coming from a parent, Misty. So what we determined is, as I've mentioned already, there was no point in asking parents to declare an intent for online or face-to-face -face if we knew it was going to be in the organizations and our students and everyone's best interest to go ahead and begin 100% um, online. We, because we're sensitive to over-surveying our community as well and asking them to do too many forms, too many documents like that. But at the bottom line is we gave a lot of deep thought we see the virus spiking in our community right now. The guidance we're receiving from our health officials say it will not be safe to gather in our schools, even if parents declare they want um, they want face to face. And as I mentioned earlier, we can't teach students if teachers are not willing or able to come to school. So we had we went back, we visited with our staff, and we that's why we can that's why we went online instead of doing that pre registration at this point in time. But again, we will do that pre-registration when it comes time to open the schools for face-to-face -face learning again. Um, Amy is asking, if the TEA extends the 100% online options for districts, will you continue online only learning as long as they allow? And the answer is, I don't know. And But because we're gonna always make decisions in relationship with our school board and our local community. So just like some districts are choosing to go face-to-face -face on their first day of school and we are not, then that's based on the community voice. We may reach a point where, where the TEA allows us to go longer online, but our community and the, and the level of pandemic in our community may indicate it's time for us to go ahead and go face-to-face, -face, even though we can continue online. So that is something we're gonna be working on that we'll assess based on risk level in real time from week to week and month to month. Becky B, another parent is asking, how long is a preliminary virtual period? How small are the small groups that will transition? How is it decided what grades students and classes will transition in what order? So I'm reading this question that it has to do with when we begin coming back into the classrooms that and all of that information and Becky will be shared at that time in great detail um, because it will vary from school to school. So a lot of that information will actually come from your principal and your campus administration. Jamie, another parent is asking, in regard to the students being required to be online throughout the day, what is going to be the expectation for the students and their families? How often will they be participating in the synchronous learning? Especially for those parents who continue to work outside of the home, what do you recommend? Jamie, this is one of the most challenging aspects of our decision-making process. As a community, we are dealing with this pandemic, not just the school district. And we know that our, our, our staff, as well as our parents, are dealing with the reality of having to work while dealing with childcare and meeting their educational needs of their children. That is important and we don't take that lightly. So Monday, we are gonna be sharing information in our board meeting with the board and public about how we can support parents who, are, who need to work, including our own staff, with some form of childcare system through our extended learning program. So we'll be sharing much more detail about that. Um, I did also get, I had some local childcare systems reach out to me as well um, recently. So I'm gonna be conferring directly with some leaders and owners of local childcare systems, private organizations, because I do think partnership with local childcare systems, if they can support us by either allowing us to place staff in their center to help with the education, or if they can set up systems and, and protocols in their place to help students in their care during the day to keep doing school, that will help parents who are needing to work not feel the full burden of trying to do it before and after work hours. So, so just know we're working with local childcare systems 
and we're going to be making some announcements about how the district can support that effort as well. But that is one of the most challenging aspects of what we're dealing with right now. Jillian R. is asking, is there a plan for children who have parents who both work full time in the office? I'm a nurse working in the medical center and my husband, a therapist who works with a vulnerable population within a hospital. Neither of us works from home. What accommodations can be made? It's not possible for my kids to be present daily from eight to four. So again, we're the Jillian, we recognize that concern and we're working on that and we'll make many announcements about that in the near future. Um, Charlotte asked a very similar question as well as Angelique G. So I think we've addressed the questions about working parents, but just again, I cannot reinforce enough how important that issue is to us because we know your availability as parents has a direct impact on the quality of your students' education while they're learning online. And we wanna make sure we're supporting your child and you in that. How will the grading system work? Deanna, would you like to speak to that one, please? Or interject on the last one as well. It sounds right. like you wanted to say something. So I, I just wanted to reinforce one piece um, that came out in one of those questions um, is the level of flexibility for asynchronous. Um, as Dr. Dupree described, asynchronous um, instruction is somewhat independent. Um, it's it's the time when students are developing their products. They may might be um, interacting with other students, but they don't need the teacher to interact in an during the asynchronous time. Now, what I'd like to clarify is that um, it's expected that two students will be um, engaged synchronous, synchronous and or asynchronous daily. That's part of the compulsory attendance piece. And much of the progress monitoring, especially for our younger, younger students is gonna be through the asynchronous platform. Um, so although there may be flexibility, it is a, a, um, an expectation that there's daily uh, engagement there. Um, in terms of our grading practices, as Dr. Dupree shared um, earlier in the presentation, when he was talking about um, the changes in um, instructional expectations, we will revert back to the grading practices that were in place prior to COVID-19. Um, and you can um, draw from the website our EIA local grading policy and read through that um, by, by level. We also have posted for the public administrative procedures and we will revert back to those policies and administrative procedures as we move forward, even in the online platform. A big part of our funding source uh, via TEA is that we show evidence that we're progress monitoring students and that there is um, a level of growth and, and progress for, for each one of our students. So the grading practices will be in place and um, teachers will be held accountable for uh, posting grades as they have. Now, the other piece that Dr. Dupree um, indicated is that we there is a grading system in Schoology. So there will be systems for you to view um, the progress and um, that your child is making via the Schoology system as well. We'll still use the Skyward system to record official grades, but there will be progress that you will be able to see and grades posted through the Schoology platform. All righty, thank you, Deanna. Um, next question is from Nicole R. Will laptops and hotspots be provided to students? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. We're actually partnering with multiple um, carriers. So we're gonna have a much broader array so that if a student is in a zone that does not have maybe um, in connectivity with one carrier, we can try a hotspot with another carrier to help them to work out that issue. But we're also gonna be working on solutions that are not, digital ba not digitally based to connect with them if we just cannot in any way help them connect in their local community. But yes, we are gonna have a distribution system for laptops and hotspots. So that's one of the reasons we're gonna be doing the student verification information next week starting next week so that you can declare what the need is and we can immediately begin to address those needs well before school begins. Another parent, I'm Amanda N, has asked, what's going to happen if a student who's working online is having internet issues and can't stay connected? Will they be, be counted absent? So we'll, those are some of the details we're going to have to work through as we, as we finalize the information about school. Um, but the answer is, as long as a student is engaging every single day, they will be counted present. So we, um, so, so yes, there will be systems though, because we know just like 
I deal with technology right here in my office from time to time that doesn't work as it should. That's real and we'll have ways to deal with that. So we don't want extra concerns about that kind of thing. I also want to share that um, I want to remind our families that when you when you declare a need for technology, you need to request it only if there is a true need. Um, because we do have limited resources, we're, we're going to do everything we can to meet the needs of all students. But think, think very carefully if your family has that need before asking for that equipment, please, because we want to make sure it's available for those who have a true need, not just those who might want a nicer or a newer model or, or something a little different. So that's I'm, my technology folks are regularly asking me to reinforce that, that comment. Um, I have a rising senior. If schools are online in August and September, will they be open as test centers for SAT and ACT? Uh, as I, Deanna, would you like to go ahead and speak to that one, please? Right. Um, um, uh, what I want to share with, with the public is that we work very closely with the college board um, and they administer a SAT and the ACT organization. Um, we're in uh, contact with our representatives for those both of those organizations on a regular basis so that we stay abreast of cancellations uh, of testing. Um, so we will work very closely with them going forward so that we can provide um, all of the available um, things that are necessary for kids to, to be assessed. Um, so if, if we're allowed to open and testing is gonna continue to go forward, then we will create testing sites. We'll um, work through the social distancing pieces uh, but again, we are driven and collaborate very closely with College Board and the ACT organization as we make those decisions. Very good, thank you. Okay, why is it that seniors are not being treated as a priority once face-to-face -face instruction resumes? Shouldn't we want to ensure they are well prepared once they begin college? Deanna, would you like to speak to that, please? What I would say is that we, we all of our students are a priority. And as Dr. Dupree um, mentioned, when we do begin our face-to-face -face phase in, we will look at all um, grade levels and determine school by school how we will begin to phase the students in. Um, our students, our senior students are a priority. Um, they're also um, students um, that are on the tail end of their education. And there's a lot of ownership that they have in their learning that some of our younger kids are still developing over time. Um, but, but we will take note. And um, I want to assure you, and we want to assure you that we do prioritize our seniors um, and we'll look at phasing all of our students in accordingly. Dr. Dupree mentioned this in our last um, session. Um, we look at some of our gateway grade levels because we know that, that those transitions are critical. Uh, we understand that seniors are also in a gateway um, situation. When we phase in, if we're phasing in, um, in a, closer to the spring semester, then um, obviously that's a critical time for seniors uh, to be in a face-to-face -face environment. So there will be a number of factors that are considered as we make decisions about what grade levels to bring in and at what time. And, and as Dr. Dupree indicated, that will be school specific in many cases because of the amount of space and the number of students in that school that may choose a face-to-face -face option. All right, um, follow up. Tasha M is asking, is there an update on STAR requirement for graduation? At this point, we have not received any further information about testing or accountability from TEA other than they do expect to go ahead and do the full STAR and end of course exams this coming spring and have accountability in place. That is subject to change if something changes at the state level. But for those students who missed an end of course exam this past year, it's my understanding you do not have to go back and take that STAR exam or end of course exam. That will, that will continue. You'll get that credit for that as you progress toward graduation. Cindy M asked, what time will school start and end? That is still subject um, for questioning at this point. Um, it'll, it'll look probably very different for online learning. But then as we resume face-to-face, -face, based on transportation and other logistical issues, it may be necessary to adjust the school schedule a little different than what it's been in the past. And that's really one of the things I want our community to continue to focus on is that in no way really can you expect anything this coming year to look anything like it did at the beginning of last school year? 
um, school start times, how the bus system works, all of those things are subject to great change um, due to make sure we're meeting the needs of our students and our staff and running the system under these unique conditions. Um, extracurricular, why are UIL athletics banned fine arts and extracurricular activities suspended during the online learning period? Does this mean UIL fall sports and activities have been canceled? Stormy is asking that question. She's a, a parent. So first of all, no, the, the, nothing has been canceled at this point, only postponed until we can get all of our students face to face again. And that is because, as I shared earlier, we believe if they cannot gather for learning in the classroom, they cannot gather for practice on the field or court either. And uh, there are th ways they can train. There are things they can do. We wanna keep them moving forward, but we don't think it's appropriate to gather and can try to continue the team sports, team um, fine arts and those kinds of things in groups when it's not appropriate, especially while our county is on red alert right now re related to the pandemic. I would also add that even back in June and early July, we ended up closing our strength and conditioning camps at our high schools for athletics because at multiple schools, we had viral spread. And so we have evidence of what will happen if we try to gather students for training. And we believe it's in our best interest to keep all those activities shut down for the time being, nothing canceled, not permanently. Um, how will fine arts classes, specifically orchestra, be handled? And what about region competitions in UIL? That's a question from Annie. Um, I, I actually was at a meeting today about the region competitions in UIL. Our marching bands um, will not be competing um, at the, in the usual competitive UIL contest or the BOA and those kinds of things this year. So, but, the, but most of the other typical UIL activities will continue in some form with solo and ensemble, those kinds of things. So there, so fine arts classes, I have seen evidence already online that some of our art teachers are doing a remarkable job of teaching art remotely. I know some of our, our some of our music folks are teaching instruments, they're sizing instruments in socially distanced ways, and they're gonna begin teaching their students remotely. So I think there's many things our creative staff is going to be able to do to engage our children, to continue their skill development, to keep them moving forward. And you'll be getting much more detail about the, the, the specifics around that um, once school, as we get closer to the opening of school. Um, Heidi is asking Deanna, how is the district going to address special education needs when there is no way to be, to, to be art compliant for so many SPED students with online education? I know Dr. Hill spoke to that. Did you have any anything further to add in response to Heidi's question? Uh, Dr. Hill answered that very comprehensively. She's still on with us. Dr. Hill, is there any additional information that you'd like to add associated with ARDS? Oh, wait, I'm, I'm not on. We can hear you, but we can can't you hear see me? You. I'm sorry, okay. I couldn't <laughs> figure out how to fix my camera, so I'll just talk. No, I just think the main thing that I would like Heidi to know as well as our other parents is you know, this is not, um, we're really working to not provide a one size fits all. Um, so although we have heard that other districts are doing similar, are doing things, it's just, you know, one size fits all, no ARDS. We're really working to uh, individualize these decisions. Our teachers want to serve our kids. And so if we can't make it work online and we try the face-to-face -face and that's not working, we are willing to be creative and figure out services that work for our kids. And so I, I just want our parents to know that that is our philosophy and we're going to do every, everything we can to serve our families. Thank you. And I know you've been doing that. I know we've had teachers going into and diagnosticians and different staff going into the homes of our students, even this summer. So we are definitely committed and I appreciate your leadership and your team's dedication to our kids. Deanna, we got a question about academies. Um, how will the 2021 plan for virtual classes and eventual in-person lessons affect the FBA ISD academies? That's a question from Ami, a parent. Right. Um, and we anticipate, well, we know that our academy courses um, will continue to go forward. Um, we'll work through asynchronous and, the, and, and synchronous learning, just as Dr. Dupree described in our academy courses, just like in all of our other courses. Um, just as I mentioned in the last um, town or chat with Charles, um, some of our academy courses are tied to CTE. So when there's a need 
for uh, a face-to-face -face or a lab. We're working collectively to afford students those experiences. If there are rounds or volunteer uh, um, components of the academy course, um, some of those we can still manage um, through a virtual platform. Other times, again, um, with, with careful consideration, we, there may be opportunities for, for, for students to engage in those pieces face-to-face, -face, but we don't anticipate a huge disruption in our academy courses um, and, and, and the instruction that they receive. We'll continue to cohort them as we typically do um, and provide the enriching activities uh, that are currently in place. Um, again, it, it will not look the same as it always has in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, however, we will be working through the synchronous and asynchronous platforms to deliver quality um, for our academy students, just like as with all of our students. Is there any change in its recent modifications of the ranking system, given the current circumstances? And the answer is no at this point. I'm sorry. No, um, my know. answer would be no, not at this time. And yeah, we're going to continue all, with the. the with policy. Grading and ranking will continue as usual. Very good. Um, for teachers who are returning back to the physical location, the classroom, what efforts are being made, if any, to accommodate their need for child care for their children during this online learning? That's coming from Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca, for asking that. I addressed that on a response to another question. We're working our best with, part, with private partners as well as within our organization to develop some structures to help with that. And we'll be sharing that information in the near future. Um, Bertha is asking, will teachers be able to work from home if they have young children that cannot be left unsupervised? And again, we're, we're gonna help our staff to the best of our ability in that regard. Are teachers expected to report to campus on August 3rd and continue to work teach from campus during the initial weeks of online learning? That's from Altrice. Um, actually, the date is now August 5th, since we not, did not change the calendar, but yes, there will be reporting to work um, on August 5th and continuing on at, until we begin the new school year. Related questions, um, what are the plans for non-teaching staff's return to work? So that, would, they would, that will be guided directly by your campus leader um, if, you're, if you're on a campus. For those who are not on a campus, all the other administrative staff, you'll be getting word from your supervisors and your departmental leaders very soon about your staged reentry into the workplace and what that will look like. What will happen to all the paraprofessionals aides this coming year? Are there any plans for them? Are teachers aides and bus drivers getting paid if we decide to do online? Should they start looking for another job? Yeah. So my answer is no, don't start looking for another job. We want you here, we need you here. We're gonna have something for you to do. It may not be what you've done in the past, but we're gonna have lots of opportunities at campuses and in central admin for wellness monitors, for um, supporting online learning, lots of different ways we can engage our team. So please keep in touch with your supervisor and let us know how, how we can best support you. Some coaches have asked if we don't have athletics, will coaches lose stipends? The answer is no. We expect you to continue working with your students going above and beyond to build them to be academic, to be to, to be scholar athletes, to be investing in them, holding them accountable for their classroom performance, to engage with them online, to do training, to learn the drills, all the things you normally would to the best of your ability virtually. So we expect our coaches to still be earning their pay even now in an online environment. Um, I've addressed the next question that was asked. Um, my child attends a campus that has cap and overflow. Cap and overflow is in place. Um, I've addressed that earlier in the presentation. Um, looking, okay, I've addressed that question thoroughly already. And I think, is Deanna, do you see any other questions or did I get to the end of them? Can't hear I you. Believe that you. I believe that you got through all of the questions. Um, have you checked the chat to see if there's anything new in there? Yes. So let's, okay. Harsha is asking, is there any info for subs and if they will have any opportunities? Absolutely. We need our sub pool. And again, we may ask some of our subs to be wellness monitors on a full-time or part-time basis. We might also use them in classrooms 
uh, are on campus to support teachers with online learning endeavors to work with small groups. There's many ways we will use our subs. So we will need you just as we always have. Toya is asking what will lunch and breaks in between classes look like? And, uh, and will they be staggered lunches and breaks to resemble school? We don't know what lunch will look like when we reopen the buildings. We could um, use the lunch rooms, but we might ask also do grab and go and serve lunch um, in the classrooms to avoid movement and contact. All of that type of detail will be shared in the near future. Um, how will dual credit classes be handled? Deanna, would you like to speak to that, please? Doris is asking about dual credit. Right. Um, well, we're working in concert with our with our dual credit um, partners, and so um, they're they're working online as well. Um, so we will there will not be an impact to our dual credit courses. Again, um, we the our in house teachers will follow this the semester calendar uh, via um, um, Houston Community College. Um, as we have in the past, um, but we will work through um, the, the similar platforms as we as we normally would. So there, we should not see a disruption or an impact in our dual credit courses. Thank you. All right, so that is the end of our questions, and I don't want to rush to the end, but we're at the end, and I just want to wrap up quickly, and I want to thank you again for being with us. And I hope that you've learned something and our answers were helpful. It was not our goal ever to rush real quickly through any of the answers or to be dismissive because every question and every response is important, but we did try to move quickly. So if you have further questions, please continue to use our Let's Talk feature on the district website under COVID-19. And that's the best way to get the best responses, emailing me, emailing others in the district. They're likely to get lost and take a little longer to get to. So please use the Let's Talk feature. But no, we do care about your questions. We care about your concerns. And I'm closing, I'm gonna ask you to be patient, whether you're a parent, student or staff, please be patient. We are all working in circumstances we would not have ever anticipated working under. And we have got campus leaders, we have got hundreds of people in this district out of our 11,000 employees, I can guarantee hundreds of them are working day and night, including during district closures, over weekends, not taking vacation right now to get ready to do our very best for your children. Things are moving quickly. Decisions are being made quickly. Things change quickly from the state level, from the local level. And we're always gonna keep our website up to date we're gonna send you real-time communications and keep you informed. So I'm gonna ask you to please be patient and remember that we care about you and your children individually, but we also have to care about the 79,000 we serve in our district. So it's all about doing this as a community, caring for our community. So hang in there with us. I guarantee so many people are working really, really hard to make sure your student as an excellent experience during the coming school year. Deanna, did you have anything um, else to say? I just, you know, I wanna reiterate that we are committed. Um, we, we know that education is, um, is critical for our children and um, our commitment is to continue to educate them online, uh, knowing and please know that um, as soon as we're able to bring them back face to face, we're ready to love on them and um, educate them in the best way possible. That's so. right. You chose Fort Bend ISD because of our schools, and we're going to deliver even under these circumstances. So thank you for being our partner. Thanks for led, trusting us with your children. We're going to have a great year together. Even though it's going to be a little different, it's going to be a good year. I have confidence. Thank you so much for your time this evening.